<laughs> what did you say? You didn't graduate from college? That's ridiculous. You're joking, right? The mocking laughter directed at my father. Confronting my irritation was the statement, Your parents only finished high school and run their own business? That's just not good enough. You, as a marriage partner for Nick, are disqualified. That was the verdict. My name is Mary. I'm 25 and just got engaged to my boyfriend Nick. He's, to put it nicely, a dependable man who takes charge. But on the downside, he can be a bit arrogant and stubborn. No one is perfect, and I certainly have my fair share of flaws. It's important to compliment and elevate each other's good and bad point. That's why I decided to marry him. But there's something I just can't tolerate. It's our different attitudes toward money. Nick seems to have grown up in a wealthy family and is quite casual about money. He dislikes being stingy, and to him, the word saving might as well be, what's that? Is it tasty? For example, if I made a homemade lunch, he'd say, Huh? Homemade lunch? If you're gonna make something, at least spend more money to make it luxurious. It's embarrassing. That's just not fair when I put effort into making it for a date. If I take out a water bottle because I'm thirsty, he'd say, If you're thirsty, why don't we just go to that cafe? Being stingy is so unattractive. It's like saying you have no money, which is embarrassing. A cafe for just a little thirst seems excessive. When I suggest he should visit an ENT doctor if he hears things like I have no money, he says he doesn't hear such hallucinations. What's with that? When I find a piece of clothing I like and want to buy it, he's shocked. No way! I've never seen a piece of clothing that doesn't cost over $100. When I ask if his socks cost over $100, he says they don't. He sulks and says, Socks aren't clothes. But I think socks are underwear, and underwear is clothing. If I point that out, he gets irritated and shouts, Shut up! Poor people should just keep quiet! I hate that phrase. Now is the time for eco-friendliness and saving. Mocking that and presumptuously labeling someone as poor is disrespectful. I tell him his condescending attitude will make him disliked, but he just laughs it off. Sorry for being rich! You, being poor, wouldn't understand the mindset of the wealthy. You should try harder. It's you. I swallow the words I want to say back. Saying them would only lead to a fight. Why am I with such a man? Well, he has his good points. We met at the same company. It all started when he covered for a mistake I made. When I thanked him, he returned a refreshing smile. Like the scent of mint. Now, his constant bragging about being rich is getting on my nerves. Yesterday, I went to look at suits at that high-end brand store. Yet, yeah, it's crazy how everything looks good on me. The salesperson was like, you look great in these. So I ended up buying all three suits. Well, the salesperson is just doing their job, with a business smile. By the way, that tacky purple suit should never make another appearance at the office. A client made a face the moment they saw it. It's fine for television appearances, though. Huh? Me? A handsome guy who looks good on TV? Yeah, maybe it's because my wealth is apparent. That's not it. You should spend more on grooming yourself. Whoa, did you notice that? That woman who just passed by definitely looked at me. I'm wearing a cheap outfit that totals only about 1000 today. Thinking of buying a new car. What, I just bought one last year? Well, I have so much money, I need to spend it. It's not me choosing the money, the money chooses me. Endless bragging about being rich. I don't really understand the last part. I wonder if I'm the only one who can stay with such a person and just laugh it off. It's almost like a joke, and my friends always give me a wry smile when they see me laughing along. But honestly, if I could just properly handle his constant bragging about wealth, he'd be a fairly enjoyable person. That's why I thought it would be okay to marry him, and when he proposed, I was so happy I cried. At that moment, he said, I knew it! I knew it! You, being poor, must be overjoyed to marry a rich guy like me. It's a real marry up, isn't it? So I just went blank-faced and said, Maybe we should call it off. Which made him panic. My fiancé, despite his excessive bragging about wealth, does love me in his own way. I'm nervous. I held my chest, feeling my heart might just jump out due to the intense nervousness. Today is the day of the family meeting. I barely slept last night due to the nerves, so I'm pretty sleep-deprived. High-strung, you could say. 
I slathered on foundation because I looked pale, and he said, You look like a mannequin. So I hurriedly fixed it in the bathroom of the station we passed. We took a taxi from the station to his parents' mansion. Seeing that luxurious mansion, I felt like turning back. The big house was partly hidden behind large walls and well-maintained pine trees. I could see that the large pine tree beyond the wall was well-maintained. The gate itself was beautifully designed. As we passed through the gate, the garden was even more impressive than I imagined from the outside. Across the magnificent garden was a large pond, almost big enough to swim in. Elegant koi fish, red, white, and gold, swam gracefully in the pond. Their swimming seemed so serene, a feeling of ease. Just having a pond in a private garden is surprising, let alone such a world of fantasy. I definitely felt out of place. I don't regret deciding to marry him, but thinking about marrying into this family? Well, that's something I'm starting to regret. A bit, or rather, quite a bit. Marriage should be about the two people involved, but it seems it's not going to be that simple. The courage I mustered when leaving my house was quickly fading away. Finally, we arrived at the mansion after crossing the garden. Inside, I was led to a room in the back, where his parents were sitting on a sofa in a large living room. Both stood up. Ah, oh, good to see you. I'm Nick's father. Pleased to meet you. I'm Nick's mother. Contrary to my expectations, they seemed quite gentle, which brought a bit of relief. Still unable to completely relax, I sat down, facing coffee and cookies, and the family meeting proceeded in a friendly manner. It seemed like it would end without any issues. Just when I let out a sigh of relief, John changed the topic with a serious look. So, what do Mary's parents do? As you can see, my father's business has been hugely successful. I'm the second generation. Nick plans to take over as the third generation someday. Currently, he's working at a different company for experience. My wife, by the way, is a homemaker. Uh, my dad runs a factory. A factory? John tilted his head at my explanation. My father manages a factory that has been in our family since my grandfather's time, manufacturing a certain kind of unique part. It's not a large factory, but the parts we handle are quite rare and highly valued. Interesting. And which university did your father graduate from? University? No, my father graduated from a technical college. Why do they assume it has to be a university? I answered, puzzled and tilting my head. At that moment, John burst out laughing. Ah <laughs> What? Didn't graduate from college? Is this some kind of joke? That's right, a father who didn't even go to college? And what about your mother? Uh, she works in the office at dad's company. Oh my, she works too? Can't even afford to hire employees? How terrible. His parents laughed together, leaving me dumbfounded, and I just answered their questions. Their laughter grew louder. At that moment, I realized his parents were looking down on mine. Look, I know my father only graduated high school, but he's proud of his work. I couldn't hold back and replied, only to be interrupted by... Hey, Mary! What are you saying? It was Nick. What do you mean, what? I didn't know either, but I guess it's understandable that they laugh if he's just a high school graduate. What do you mean? It was John who continued Nick's words. Mary, let me tell you, being just a high school graduate is not good. You get it? Of course, Nick and I graduated from college. A capable person is one who can study. Not being able to study means you lack fundamental knowledge. Do you think such a person can succeed? That's right. My husband and Nick are capable. That's why they graduated from college. My husband was recognized for his excellence and became the president of a major company. And Nick will become a president too because of his excellence in college. It's a realm far beyond what a high school graduate could reach. But my dad... Okay, enough. I get it. Mary, arguing with us about everything seems to be of low caliber too. We're successful, so we're right. But you can't even listen to that? No common sense. Someone like you isn't suitable for our son. What? Really? We wondered what kind of person would come. But this is a huge disappointment. Your parents are high school graduates with their own business? That's not even worth discussing. Mary, you're disqualified as Nick's marriage partner. What? I couldn't believe it. I felt out of place, but to be opposed for such a reason? And disqualified? What does that even mean? 
How condescending can you be? It's one thing to speak ill of me, but I couldn't stand them speaking ill of my parents. What did Nick think about all this? When I glanced at him, I saw him smirking unbelievably. Nick? Ugh, can't be helped. If my parents oppose it, there's nothing I can do. So, no marriage then. Too bad, Mary. You won't be able to marry me. He didn't argue with his parents. Didn't say he wanted to marry me. He didn't stand up for me. In that moment, everything I felt for him disappeared. My love for him completely vanished. Feeling this, I stood up silently. Excuse me, I said, leaving behind only those words. All I could hear behind me was laughter. The despicable laughter that looked down on me and my parents. As I walked away briskly, a voice called out from behind. It was Nick. What? Hey, give it back! Excuse me? The engagement ring! I shouldn't have given it to you! What a waste of money! Once we were supposed to be in love, but for his last words to be like that, it's the worst. I yanked off the ring and threw it at Nick. What a waste I was too! I want back all the wasted time I spent with you! Saying that, I finally left the mansion. I'm so angry. I stabbed the stake with my fork roughly, and my father, startled, said, You're scaring me, Mary. It's been a few days since that infuriating family meeting, and I was back at my parents' house. Why? Because today was supposed to be the day he visited my parents with me. I couldn't bring myself to tell my parents exactly what his had said. I just said, They think people who didn't study well are no good. That probably didn't explain everything, but my parents just gently patted my head and didn't press further. I was so grateful for their understanding that I cried. So for a change of mood, though not exactly drowning my sorrows in alcohol, I ended up at this steakhouse. Even as I eat delicious food, I feel sick every time I remember his family's words and expressions. I could have tolerated just the bragging about wealth, but I can't forgive his parents' attitude and him for allowing it. I've moved on, and my feelings have completely cooled off, but the anger doesn't seem to subside easily. The more I remember, the hungrier I get from anger. You can order more if you want. The best way to forget a heartbreak is to eat. My mother said gently. I was about to cry again, and wiped my eyes roughly, smiling. Then I'll have a T-bone. And, Dad, want a drink? Ah, oh, well then. That was when it happened. Isn't that Mary over there? A voice I never wanted to hear again and wished to forget reached my ears. Ugh, Nick? I turned around hesitantly and there was Nick, standing with his parents. Why here of all places? This is my hometown. The place where my father was born and raised, where I grew up. Why do I have to meet them here? As I turned pale at the dreadful coincidence, John said, Oh, aren't the poor stretching themselves too thin? This place is expensive, you know. He's as unpleasant as ever. Why are you here, Mary? That's my line. This is my hometown, Nick. Why are you here? Ah, I'm here because Dad was born around here. We stopped by after visiting our ancestor's grave. You know, this place is famous, often featured on TV, right? What a terrible coincidence. As expected, their comments were full of sarcasm. Mary, don't leave without paying, okay? It's not good to become reckless just because I broke up with you. Mary, maybe you should just drink water and leave. This place is really expensive, after all. Mary, even if you're struggling with money, don't come to my son for help, okay? If you're nice to poor people once, they take advantage of you. I've decided not to indulge them. In their eyes, my family was completely poor and couldn't afford to pay here. We're just normal, and I can pay for this place with my own earnings. It's infuriating, but responding to them is just a waste of time. I decided to ignore them. But then, I was nudged unexpectedly. It was my father. My father whispered to me, Mary, who are those people? I replied quietly, my ex fiancés family. Then, my father stroked his chin and nodded thoughtfully, saying, Hmm. I wondered what he was thinking when he suddenly whispered, Since we're here, maybe I should say hello. I was puzzled, especially because he had a mischievous smile. I don't really understand it, but that face seems to have some meaning. I stood up and said to John, Um, my dad would like to say hello, if that's okay. Uh, well, sure. 
It's not often poor people get to talk to someone like me. It'll be a good memory for them. How condescending can he be? I was irritated, but my dad patted my shoulder, somehow keeping my anger in check. Then my dad stepped forward, smiling broadly, his family looking equally puzzled. Watched as my dad said cheerfully, Long time no see. Uh? Both his family and I were confused. My mother, remaining seated, sipped her coffee, disinterested. What's going on? My father then said, Ah, uh, John, it's been a while. John's father was shocked. Uh, John? Uh, David? Oh, yeah, you remember. We're both so old now. I didn't understand for a moment. No, neither do I. Is it really David? We were all dumbfounded. It turns out my father and John were classmates. My father had never left this land since he was born. But John moved away right after middle school when his grandfather became successful. Such an unexpected reunion. So you opposed your daughter's marriage because her parents weren't well educated? You mean Mary's parents. You, the high school graduate who runs a factory. That's right. I'm the high school graduate you laughed at. Ugh. What's with the ew? Neither I, nor he, nor Jane understood. My father, still smirking, explained, This guy had the worst grades in middle school. What are you saying? It's true, isn't it? You used to come crying to me all the time before exams. John, flustered by my father's revelation, couldn't stop him. Bad at studying means no good? So you're no good then. You were at the bottom of our class in middle school. And your high school wasn't exactly top tier, was it? That's not true. It, it's a well-known high school. Well, that high school's reputation soared only in recent years. But our generation knows that going there meant no future. Seriously. I asked Nick about John's high school and looked it up. It recently became a top school. But before that, what a surprise. Wow. I blurted out. But I graduated from college. It's strange, isn't it? I heard a weird rumor about how impossible it would have been to get into college from that high school. Something about using money for backdoor admission. No way! That's not true! It's been decades since then. The truth is probably hidden in the darkness, unknowable now. But John's frantic reaction seemed to say it all. Dad, by the way, how were your grades in middle school? Hmm? Oh, I was always at the top, and in high school too. I never knew that. My dad never talked about it. Not something worth talking about, right? But then, why didn't you go to college? I didn't have anything particular I wanted to learn. Instead, I thought it'd be more useful to go to a technical school, learn specialized skills, and get a certificate for work at the factory. I still study various things on my own, though. As we all stood dumbfounded, my father tapped John's shoulder. But you're amazing, you know. You couldn't even solve elementary school problems. And now you're a company president? You really worked hard. My father seemed genuinely impressed. But John retorted, Shut up! Don't be so familiar! I'm a successful man, I'm not like you! And left the restaurant in a pathetic manner. Nick and Jane hurriedly followed him. After the whirlwind of events, I could only mutter, What was that all about? Years later, after not meeting Nick's family again, I received an unexpected phone call. From Nick. He had quit his job right after that incident to join his father's company rumored to be preparing for succession. Why call now, after all this time? Just when I was wondering what was going on, I was told that the company had gone bankrupt. If you ask me, management is in shambles due to his own unreasonable management policies. Competent employees had all left, and only the incompetent father and son Nick, and a few others remained. The employees who had left formed a new successful company, quickly overshadowing and leading to the bankruptcy of Nick and John's company. Now, they were jobless and penniless. Hey Mary, I saw a magazine at a bookstore mentioning your dad's company. It's thriving and very successful, isn't it? Indeed it was. I quit my job to help at my father's factory, and his passion and drive were astonishing. The factory had grown significantly due to handling unique parts and high precision. However, my father does not retire from the field to relax, and continues to work hard at the field today. I often get interviewed on TV and in magazines, 
but I never thought I'd see it. Can you hire me? I'm such a great talent. Many places want me. I'm willing to work at your place out of old time's sake. I couldn't help but burst out laughing. Because I know. Nick was still looking down on others and getting rejected at every interview. He must have been desperate to come to me. With that attitude, he couldn't hope to be employed. We're quite full with capable people. If you're so in demand, find another place. What? But you'll regret not working with me. You're beloved. Too bad. My love belongs to my husband now. What? And my two adorable children? What? So I'll have to decline your application to our company. What a pity, huh? With those words echoing the pity I had once heard, I hung up. I thought I heard him wailing on the other end, but I didn't listen. I set my phone to reject his calls, and made sure he couldn't reach the company either. What happened to his family after that? I don't know. I never heard their names again. As for me, I am surrounded by my loving husband and children, living happily in a warm home. While raising my kids, I help with my father's work and continue to learn. Life is an eternal study. With that belief, I'm motivated to keep going every day. I'm going to make my wife work with only $50 for groceries every month. At our wedding, my husband proudly made this declaration, leaving me stunned. The joyous and blissful atmosphere of the wedding froze in an instant. I'm so lucky I've scored myself a cheap housemaid. As I realized that this was his intention, I felt like everything was going dark before my eyes. Then a stern voice echoed throughout the venue. Is that all you wanted to say, you bastard? As my father stood up and approached us, my husband condescendingly said, Don't get cocky, old man. My husband, who was looking down on my father, had no idea about what was waiting for him. My name is Sarah. I met my husband, Jack, in college. We were in the same year. We lost contact after graduation, but when we were 24, he threw a reunion party. That night, I drank a little too much and felt sick. Jack looked after me and said to our classmates, Don't force her to drink. He was really considerate of me. He had matured a lot since his wild college days and treated me really nicely and carefully, as if I were a precious gem or a princess. He confessed that he had actually liked me since we were in the same class, and that he threw the reunion because he wanted to see me again. We soon started dating, and after a few months I moved into his apartment. When we were 25, he proposed and we got married. Turns out, Jack was the heir to a big corporation. He never boasted about it, but people often told me, wow, you've hit the jackpot. His parents, whom we met when we announced our marriage, seemed really nice and I felt relieved. My parents were also happy about my marriage with Jack. My father, a small business owner who started his business when he was young and had his share of hardships, was probably relieved that I wouldn't have to struggle. From then on, it was fun planning our wedding together, booking the venue, picking out my wedding dress. One day, with our wedding just a few months away, Jack said something unexpected at dinner. Sarah, your cooking is always delicious. I think you do great running the house as a full-time housewife. Huh? But I was planning on working even after getting married. I was surprised. My plan was to continue working, and Jack had never once said that he wanted me to quit. It's fine if you work part-time on the side while doing housework and looking after kids. I'm sure you'd want some pocket money, too. But I've been working hard at my job this whole time, and I want to continue working full-time. I need to start training a successor for the company. Leave the money-making to me, and I'd like you to focus on being a homemaker. He said while cheerfully munching on his dinner, as if he was proud of himself for being the sole breadwinner. We don't even have kids yet. Even if we do, I want to continue working. I can't put all the burden on you. Huh? Why? My persistence seemed to upset Jack, and he suddenly frowned at me. I won't slack off on housework or raising kids, please. I found myself saying that because I desperately wanted to keep working. Jack responded to my words with a bright smile. Okay, if you insist, that's fine. They say women feel uneasy when they lose connection with society. So go ahead and do your best with housework and childcare. I was relieved that he readily agreed. 
However, his words, do your best with housework and child care, didn't quite sit right with me. When I talked about this with my friends, they replied, Jack cares about you, Sarah. He's a good husband. That made me feel happy, making me feel I was being cherished and eased my concerns. After that, we sometimes discussed our future. Sarah, you're such a strong, independent woman who wants to continue working even after getting married. I'm glad to have a woman like you as my wife. His kind words always made me happy. I should also take part in some of the housework, too. All right, I'll handle the household accounts and hand you the living expenses, so we'll work with that expense every month. I always thought managing finances was a woman's job, so I was deeply moved when Jack offered to do it. Oh, I don't have to do everything by myself? That's a relief. And so came our wedding day. With many guests blessing us, the ceremony went smoothly, and I was overwhelmed with joy. Then, an incident broke out at the end of the ceremony. I'm going to make my wife work with only $50 for groceries every month. During his speech, Jack suddenly made this absurd statement. I was stunned, my mouth wide open in disbelief. The other guests started murmuring, and the festive mood instantly turned ice cold. Ah, I'm so lucky to have such a cheap maid, he said, grinning at me, oblivious to the fact that he just ruined our wedding. What on earth is he talking about? I was horrified to see him change so abruptly. I never agree to such an absurd thing as $50 a month for groceries. You agreed when I said I'll manage the finances, didn't you? Huh? Well, yes. I couldn't believe that this was his plan all along. I blanked out. I suddenly realized that he might have been deceiving me all this time. I let my wife say she wants to do all the housework and childcare while working full-time. I'm sure she'll be able to handle all the chores perfectly and make nutritious, filling meals for just $50 a month. Hearing him spout such nonsense, I quickly covered his mic with my hand. Don't just say whatever you want. I won't accept this. What's wrong? Didn't I tell you to do your best with the housework and childcare? Aren't you supposed to help out too? I never said anything like that. We can't live together like this. Suddenly, Jack's expression changed, and with a terrifying look in his eyes, he whispered in my ear, We're bound by this ceremony. It's too late to cancel the marriage now, right? We've already turned in our marriage certificate. Do you really want to get divorced? You're threatening me. Quit messing with me. I never thought I would argue with Jack, to whom I had pledged my future, on what should have been the best day of my life. Filled with regret and anger, I felt my face heat up, tears welling up in my eyes. This isn't what I signed up for. I can't believe I'm going to be misused like a servant by this man. I now deeply regretted marrying Jack. Just then, someone abruptly stood up from their seat and approached us. Is that all you wanted to say, you bastard? It was my father, Robert. His temples were throbbing, his gaze intense. I could tell he was infuriated on my behalf. How dare you treat someone's daughter like this in front of her parents? The tone in his voice froze the already tensed atmosphere in the venue. Our wedding guests held their breath, watching the stare down between my father and Jack. What's your problem? Don't get so cocky. Looking down on my father, Jack had an evil expression that I had never seen before, which made me shiver. My father's the president of a major corporation, and I'm his successor. A small business owner of a company I've never even heard of shouldn't act all high and mighty. When I introduced my father to Jack, he praised my father, saying he was a great man, despite the fact that his company was small. And he even told me, I fell in love with you, and your family background won't change my feelings for you. In the end, he had just deceived me with sweet words. Just as Jack was about to confront my father again, a loud shattering sound of glass shocked the whole venue. We all turned to see what had happened. There stood Jack's father, his hands shaking uncontrollably and his face turning to an alarming shade of blue. In stark contrast to Jack's demeanor, his father had a look of sheer panic on his face. I idiot, stop it, Jack. Don't you dare cross that man. What are you scared of? We could crush this little company in an instant and toss it aside, right? In response to Jack's mockery, his father shouted out in a trembling voice, That gentleman is one of our major shareholders! 
Huh, this old guy? Jack, with a baffled look on his face, alternated his gaze between his own father and mine. While my father's company was indeed small in scale, he had started it himself and he received compensation such as executive remuneration and dividends from stocks. Moreover, he held stocks in companies other than his own, and if he sold them, he would have assets amounting to several hundred million dollars. Among these stocks were those of the company owned by Jack's father. That's why my father, as a major shareholder, had the right to influence the company's management policies. When Jack learned this fact, he was stunned and blurted. So did you tell me to date Sarah because you wanted to get your hands on her father's wealth? It's more than that. Jack's father was seeking for something greater out of this marriage, but just didn't tell Jack about it, since his son was a guy full of himself. Jack's father had his eyes on my father's patents. He's currently paying a significant amount of money to my father's company to use that patent, but if Jack and I were to marry, he would no longer have to pay for it, and he could use it freely. Patents? And you were told to date me? Jack, you never actually liked me? What kind of nonsense is that? I'm the son of a major corporation CEO, you know. If it weren't for my dad's request, I would never be with you. What the hell? I truly loved you. Matter of fact, I was supposed to be set up with a beautiful Harris. Instead, I've been putting up with a mediocre girl like you all this time. You should be grateful. Enraged, Jack knocked a flower from the table, scattering white petals everywhere. Jack... Please don't talk anymore. Jack's father was pale as a ghost, trembling like he was seconds away from fainting. But that's all understandable. His son wouldn't stop making remarks that would infuriate the last person he'd want to cross. Shut up. It's all your fault, Dad. Just as the father-son argument was about to break up, my father's voice echoed once again. That's enough. For a moment, the room fell silent. Sarah, what are you going to do? Do you still want to marry this kind of man? My father gently asked me, but I quietly shook my head. I can't be happy marrying this sort of man. A man who would treat me as a maid, trying to have me live on fifty dollars for food every month. I just couldn't bear the thought of being with him. This is economic abuse, isn't it, Jack? I will sue you. I'm also going to annul our marriage, so be prepared for that. What? Are you okay with being a divorcee? Well, you're going to be a divorcee too, so we might as well share the pain. I won't hold back anymore. Since I realized he had no love for me, I had completely lost feelings for him. I'd rather be a divorcee than be exploited under such ridiculous conditions. When I firmly stated my decision, my father also nodded in agreement. That's probably for the best. As for your company, we will take appropriate measures. I wonder what will happen to your company from now on. When my father said this with a terrifying look on his face, it seemed Jack finally realized the gravity of the situation. He fell on his knees, begging for mercy with his father. Our foolish son has been terribly rude. We promise to educate him well to avoid any future incidents. Please, just don't cancel the marriage. Sarah was wrong. Please forgive me. I'll let you do as you like with housework, child care, and work. I won't limit your food expenses anymore. You can even hire a maid and relax at home if you want. We can hear all about your grievances in court. Dad, let's go home. I apologized to all the guests and returned all their gift money. Then I canceled the wedding. Afterwards, thanks to the skilled lawyer hired by my father, we managed to sue Jack in court. The cause of our broken engagement was determined to be Jack's fault, and he was forced to bear the full cost of our wedding fees. Plus, I also received compensation. Moreover, because he failed poorly at securing a convenience marriage and humiliated his father by having him beg on his knees, he got abandoned by his parents as well. There's no way he will ever sit in the CEO chair again. Jack, out of desperation, caused a ruckus at work and got in trouble with the police. From what I've heard, he got fired in the end. He's become worthless, aimlessly living life with no solid job. Of course, there's no chance for him to ever get set up with a Harris anymore. As a result of deceiving me and getting abandoned, his life became miserable. As for me, I ended up being a divorcee, but my father introduced me to a sincere young employee working at his company. 
I'm currently dating him, and we're planning on getting married next year. I can't believe Roger married someone so low class. There are plenty of women from good families out there. Low class. My sister-in-law looked down on me, no doubt about it. This was the first time anyone had ever insulted me so blatantly. Is it okay to belittle someone this much based on money and education? I was fuming inside. My name is Alice. I'm 26 years old. Last year, I married Roger, a 28-year-old man. I work at a cake shop run by my mom, and it just so happened that I was the one who served Roger when he first came in. He lives somewhere nearby and started coming into the store more often. Eventually, after some persistent efforts on his part, we exchanged numbers. Our relationship developed from there, and we started going out together. As we spent time together, I started to notice something. Turns out, Roger is from a ridiculously wealthy family. His parents own several businesses and currently live in France. Roger himself also runs an IT-related company. He drives a fancy sports car and lives in a condominium that's more than spacious for one. As I got to know all this, I started feeling increasingly uneasy. I felt like the worlds we lived in were just too different. Despite my concerns, he finally made a formal proposal. Alice, will you marry me? Roger, I appreciate the offer, but I'm worried. Why? What's bothering you? Well, you and your family are incredibly wealthy. Our worlds just seem so different. I don't know if we can make it work. It doesn't matter. The house, the money, none of that is important. What's important is how we feel about each other. Roger reassured me with those words. I was touched by his words. Feeling that maybe we could make it together. I accepted Roger's proposal. When Roger told his parents in France about our engagement over the phone, they immediately approved, saying, If it's someone Roger chose himself. However, the issue was Roger's sister, Hillary. She's 32 and has a four-year-old daughter. Hillary's husband also runs a business, and the family lives in a high-rise apartment in a prime location. Roger didn't get into the details to spare my feelings, but it seemed that Hillary was against our marriage. Still, Roger reassured me. No matter what my sister says, I'm going to marry you, Alice. We could even have a small ceremony abroad, just the two of us. What do you think? Although a bit unsure, I was moved by Roger's passion and accepted his idea. And so we held a small wedding ceremony and became a happily married couple. Later, we returned to his home country and started our life together in his condo. One day, the home phone rang. Roger was out for work, and I was alone. Hello? Hello? This is Hillary, Roger's sister. Uh, hello. Nice to meet you. I'm Alice. You're Alice? I heard you two had a small wedding. Just the two of you? Yes, we did. Was that your idea? Um, no, it was Roger's idea, and I agreed. Hmm, surprising. Running off and getting married like that? So your family owns a bakery, right? Yes. And do you work there? Yes, I do. Since when? Um, since I was 16. What? 16? What about high school? I dropped out and started working right away. You're kidding, really? Yes, it's true. Why didn't you go to high school? Well, there were various circumstances. Ah, so you dropped out of school, huh? Yes. Well, I went from elementary all the way through college in a pre-K college school, so it's surprising to me that people drop out these days. After that, Hillary continued to ask me various personal questions. An hour of this back and forth left me emotionally drained by the time I finally hung up. The way she spoke to me, her entire demeanor felt condescending. Later that night when Roger got home, I told him about my conversation with Hillary. Hearing this, he looked visibly frustrated. She intentionally called when I wasn't around, didn't she? Alice, I'm sorry you had to go through that. It's okay. I've known for a while that my sister doesn't approve of our marriage. 
but it doesn't matter what she thinks. This is my marriage, not hers. If she calls again, you don't have to answer. That's what Roger said. I still had some worries, but I knew that Roger cared for me, and I had made up my mind to marry him. Regardless of what anyone said, I decided to focus on building a happy home. Then one day, after Roger got back from work, he told me, Alice, my parents are actually coming back from France. Oh? Yeah, we've already told them we got married, so my mom and dad said they'd like to meet you and your mom. They suggested we all get together for a meal. I see. My heart started pounding. This meant I would be meeting Roger's parents for the first time. And that also meant I'd be face to face with that Hillary I had talked to over the phone. So it's going to be the first time you're meeting my parents, huh? I lost my dad a while back, and Mom was living alone in her house. Roger had already visited and greeted my mom, who was completely on board with our marriage. A dinner gathering, huh? Makes me a little nervous. Don't worry, you'll be fine. Roger reassured me. The dinner would take place at an upscale hotel restaurant booked entirely for the occasion by Roger's parents. Roger's family attending the event would include his parents, Hillary's husband, and their four-year-old daughter, and oddly enough, Hillary's in-laws. On my end, it would just be my mom. Finally, the day before the big dinner arrived, I was working at the bakery as usual. Mom said, I'll bring these treats with us for everyone tomorrow, as she packed up the shop's most popular sweets. After finishing my work, I went home and found myself pondering in front of my closet, deciding what to wear for tomorrow's dinner. That's when the phone rang. It was from Hillary. Roger had told me to ignore her calls, but I thought this might be something urgent about tomorrow, so I picked up. Hello? Alice, do you have a minute? Yes. Look, about tomorrow's dinner, would you mind not coming? Excuse me? I don't know how much you're aware of, but... Hillary then went on a long spiel about how her parents have assets worth around $300 million, own several properties in France and domestically, and that all the attendees of the dinner are graduates from top-notch colleges or postgraduate programs. My husband's family also comes from a long line of wealthy people. They have a dignified history. In some ways, they're even more impressive than us. Business owners, doctors, college professors, lawyers. Well, that's generally the type of careers they're in. Right. So, what I'm getting at is, if you show up at the dinner meeting tomorrow, you'll definitely stand out. Stand out? Yes, you're a dropout, right? Yes. So naturally you would stand out at the dinner. You probably won't even keep up with the level of conversation. And it might be awkward for your mom, too. But, but... Don't interrupt me. You know what I mean, right? It's just not the right place for you. Or maybe it's like you're from a different world altogether. You don't want to embarrass yourself in front of everyone, do you? True, I didn't go to high school, and my family isn't wealthy. But I'm married to Roger now, so I at least want to formally meet and greet his parents. That's exactly why I told Roger it wouldn't work out. He never listens. So, did you have your sights set on marrying into money? Are you after our fortune? You must have been the one to make advances toward Roger, right? That's not true. Hmm. There should have been better options for Roger. I don't know how he ended up with you. In any case, don't come to the dinner meeting tomorrow. I'll come up with some excuse for you. Say you're feeling unwell or something. As far as our family is concerned, it's enough if just Roger shows up. But Roger is marrying someone so unsophisticated when he could have been with someone of a better pedigree. Unsophisticated? I apologize for speaking my mind like that. Anyway, please skip tomorrow's dinner. So let's leave it at that. With that, Hillary abruptly ended the call. I was shaking with anger and disbelief. Tears started flowing from the frustration. I had never been insulted like this before. At the same time, I started to lose confidence. Could I really hold a conversation in front of Hillary and her family who speak to me like this? With these thoughts, I called my mom 
and told her everything. Mom listened attentively and said firmly, I'll handle it. So the day of the dinner arrived. Roger's parents had also gathered at the reserved restaurant. Hillary showed up fashionably dressed head to toe in designer brands, hand in hand with her daughter. Mom, Dad, it's been a while. You both look well. Oh, Alice couldn't make it due to poor health. What? But this dinner was supposed to be for meeting Alice. Yes, that was the main reason we came back to the country. Then Roger spoke up. Poor health. Sis, don't lie. Alice and her mom are here. Alice? At Roger's call, my mom and I appeared. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Hillary looked shocked, with her eyes wide open. Oh, Alice, we finally meet. Are you feeling all right? Feeling all right? I'm perfectly fine, as you can see. Hillary frowned but remained silent. And so, we exchanged greetings and sat down to begin the meal. Roger's parents were really easygoing and seemed to go out of their way to put me at ease. Then, out of the blue, Hillary turned to me with a question. So, Alice, what's your area of expertise? My expertise? Yes, what did you major in at college? Well, you see, our family mostly has a background in economics and business. That's true for Dad and Roger, too. So what about you, Alice? Actually, I didn't go to college. I only finished middle school. The room went silent when I said this. Hillary cracked a slight smile. Why bring that up now, sis? Roger started to speak, but my mom interrupted him. It's all right. Let me explain our situation. My mom prefaced it like that and then looked around the room. Alice is not my biological child. The room was shocked again. My husband and I couldn't have children, so we adopted Alice from an orphanage when she was just a baby. Alice grew up without knowing this, but she discovered the truth in her second year of middle school when she stumbled upon some documents from the orphanage. We had to tell her the truth. Everyone listened to Mom's story with, with serious faces. When Alice found out, she was unbelievably shocked, and then my husband got sick. His illness progressed rapidly, and he passed away. We run a bakery, and losing him was a significant blow. We were struggling financially. That's when Alice said, I'll drop out and work in the shop right away. I told her to go to high school, but her mind was made up. Knowing that they aren't my biological parents, but still raised me with so much love and care, I felt grateful to them. Despite my tantrums, my parents indulged me. They scolded me when I needed to be scolded, so I wanted to work in the bakery and help Mom, who was now alone. When I heard about this from Alice, I just fell even more in love with her. I mean, think about it. If you found out as a teenager that your parents weren't your biological parents and that money was tight because your dad passed away, you could have easily gone off the rails, rebelled, or even run away, right? But Alice decided to be thankful and started working to give back. That's why I wanted to marry her. After Roger finished speaking, his parents had tears in their eyes. Roger, you really did find an incredible person. Absolutely. It's been a long time since I've been this touched, Alice. Please take good care of Roger from now on. And thank you, Alice's mom, for sharing all of this with us. She's such a thoughtful daughter. Yes, blood connection or not, Alice is our precious daughter. So I'm very thankful to Roger, who chose her as his wife and is treating her so well. With that, my mom brought out a bag of homemade sweets. We brought some of our homemade sweets for everyone. Please take some home. Mom handed out the sweets, and everyone was delighted. On the other hand, Hillary looked anything but pleased. Roger turned to Hillary and began to speak. Hillary, do you get it now? I was the one who was totally smitten and went after her aggressively. We're married because of that. Stop making unfounded accusations that Alice is after my money. Then Hillary responded. What, Roger? What are you talking about? I never said any such thing. Stop lying. It's not a lie. Listen. Roger then turned up the volume on his mobile phone, playing a recorded conversation. 
It was a conversation between Hillary and me from last night. Roger had told me to record any phone conversations I had with Hillary, so I had quickly pressed the record button yesterday. Everyone heard Hillary's voice pressuring me to skip the dinner party and ridiculing me. The part where Hillary accused me of marrying Roger just for his money was also played for all to hear. Hillary froze, looking really awkward, and all eyes turned to her. Even Hillary's husband and her parents had their eyes wide open in disbelief. Hillary, what an inappropriate thing to say. Her husband was astonished. Even their four-year-old daughter chimed in. Mommy, stop being mean. At this, Hillary was speechless. She was sweating from the awkwardness and looked down. And so the dinner party came to an end. I bumped into Hillary in the restroom as I was leaving. She let out a big sigh and then completely ignored me, walking past at a fast pace. The next day, my phone rang. It was Hillary. Given that she'd ignored me and sighed heavily the day before, I thought talking to her again wouldn't lead to anything good, so I didn't answer. She kept calling again and again. I hesitated, but continued to ignore her thinking she would probably just berate me again. Finally, her calls became so persistent that it started to freak me out, so I blocked her number. A few days later, a sealed letter arrived from Hillary. I was scared to open it, but Roger and I decided to see what was inside together. Then, I apologize for the harsh things I said last time. The truth is, my mother-in-law loves the sweets from Alice's shop. She wants to place a large order for her hobby tea parties. She's been pressing me to contact you daily, which is why I've been calling. I was going to reach out to the shop directly, but I felt I had to apologize to Alice first. I'm truly sorry for the hurtful things I've said. I've reflected deeply on it. Please contact me as soon as possible. Hillary. Expecting some snide comment, I found myself unintentionally laughing with Roger. <laughs> As we read the apology and the request. So I immediately reached out to Hillary. Alice, thanks for calling me back. And I'm really sorry for all the terrible things I said. My mother-in-law fell in love with the sweets we got at the dinner party. They really stand out. She was quite impressed. Could we place an order for several kinds? Of course. I'd be happy to accommodate. Really? You're a lifesaver. After that, Hillary stopped being nasty to me. Even better, she started placing a lot of orders at our bakery, causing our profits to soar. The shop became so busy that just Mom and I couldn't keep up. Now we've even hired part-time employees. Roger said, I've always hated my sister for being so bossy and domineering. But she's mellowed out now, thanks to Alice. Thank you. Upon further inquiry, it turned out Hillary had been worried that her in-laws would look down on her because her husband's family was wealthier and because her brother married a woman who had dropped out of school. But it was all in Hillary's head. Her in-laws actually loved the cakes from our shop after the dinner party. It seemed like Hillary had reflected on her behavior. Time passed, and recently... I found out I'm pregnant. When I shared the news, Roger, both our parents, and even my mom were thrilled. I'm spending my days looking forward to the baby's birth. Once the child is born, I plan to build an even happier family with Roger. I'm just saying it like it is. You shouldn't be rude to others, you know. My name is Emma. I'm a 30-year-old working professional. I can't complain about my married life with Ethan, who's great at sharing the household chores. However, the thorn in my side has always been my mother-in-law and her daughter Emily, who live close by. My mother-in-law has been on her own since her husband, my father-in-law, passed away a few years ago, and now she and Emily live together. While mother-in-law works part-time, Emily has a full-time job. Emily is 37, single, and so similar to her mom in both looks and temperament that you might mistake one for the other from behind. 
Both of them are especially fond of my husband, who's the youngest and the only son in the family, so they're usually tough on me. From the moment we visited their home to announce our engagement, it was clear that neither mother-in-law nor Emily were my biggest fans. At that point, I was already hesitant about having to interact with them in the future, and was wondering if my love for Ethan would be enough to deal with it. However, I took the plunge into marriage because Ethan promised to always be there for me. Right after we got married, it became a weekly ritual to visit the in-laws where mother-in-law and Emily would ignore me as if I didn't exist, all the while acting as if they were enjoying a perfect, family-only gathering. After enduring this for about three months, I had reached my breaking point. One day, I grabbed Ethan's arm and dragged him to the front door, shooting a glare at mother-in-law and Emily who were following us, shouting. We left their house, and once we were safely away, I broke down in tears and told Ethan how deeply their actions were affecting me. Ethan, bless his heart, hadn't even noticed the emotional bullying because he's such a laid-back and carefree person. His attempts to placate me without understanding the core issues only made me angrier, and I gave him the silent treatment for the rest of the day. The next evening, Ethan came home late from work and immediately bowed his head in apology. Apparently, after discussing last night's events with his co-workers, they were unanimous in their disapproval and gave him a bit of scolding during lunch. He admitted that at first, he was surprised everyone was siding with me, but after listening to their opinions, he began to see that his mom and sister were indeed out of line. Feeling grateful for the enlightenment from Ethan's co-workers, I reflected on the possibility that I hadn't been the most mature person in the situation either. Then Ethan picked up the phone to call his mother. The last time my husband yelled, Emma is an important person who joined our family, so don't you dare disrespect her. I had a newfound respect for him. Mother-in-law and Emily said that they wanted to apologize, but honestly, I would rather they just left me alone. However, respecting my husband's feelings, who understood mine, I reluctantly accepted their apologies. For appearances, we made up. All was quiet for a while until my husband got an invitation from mother-in-law to go out for dinner. I wasn't thrilled about it, but agreed to go anyway. When we met mother-in-law and Emily after a long time, they seemed overly cheerful. But the moment my husband went to the restroom, Emily said, Oh, you're here too? Even though you're an outsider? I told my brother today was a family-only dinner. And then mother-in-law chimed in, Oh, really? An outsider is here? Well, what's done is done. Mom, if you say things like that, you'll get scolded by Ethan again. It sounds like we're harassing her. Emma? Sorry. We just say what's on our mind. Don't mind us. Emily smirked, just like her mother. They were ignoring me like I was invisible just a short time ago. Now this? I've learned that people who claim to be frank are usually the opposite. Mother-in-law and Emily kept emphasizing the word outsider, clearly unhappy about being reprimanded by my husband. Ah, a change in tactics, I see. I quickly understood their intent. If they can't ignore me, they'll use their words to push me away. Whether they had a strategy meeting or were in sync, this mother-daughter duo was very much alike. On the dinner table, mother-in-law, Emily, and my husband had matching bowls and chopsticks, while I was given worn-out dishes and disposable chopsticks. Sorry, we thought this was a family-only dinner, so we didn't prepare for outsiders, mother-in-law said, forcing a smile. My husband sharply retorted, Mom, did you forget to prepare for Emma, or is this intentional? Caught off guard, mother-in-law stammered, I, I just forgot to buy it. Quickly, Emily also apologized, but the moment my husband turned away, she glared at me. As we began eating, Emily suddenly stood up and announced, I have some news today! I'm getting married! Seeing the surprise on my face and my husband's, mother-in-law gleefully said, He's such a wonderful person, you know! He's got an impressive job, so I thought it's fine to approve of this relationship. It was as if she was bragging about her own love life. Emily's boyfriend is a salesman from a company that her office deals with. He was charmed by Emily's efficiency at work and asked her out. In reality, Emily is a career woman who looks good in a suit. At first glance, she appears to be highly talented, so the story seems believable. I've never had issues getting married, you know, Emily continued. It's just that my personality is so straightforward, almost masculine, 
that guys are intimidated by me. Oh, I'm so jealous of Emma. Emma is, you know, the type guys want to protect. Like she can't live without a man. She just radiates that vibe. Ethan has always been weak for that type, so I'm really jealous. I don't have a manipulative bone in my body. Emily went on. He's the type who can see the real me, you know? He thinks I'm cool. Right, Mom? Absolutely, Mother-in-law chimed in. And besides, he's not the type to tattle on my son with paranoid accusations, so I can relax. When you get married, I'll move in with you, of course. As joyous and celebratory as they were, Mother-in-law and Emily didn't miss a beat in belittling me. I was so taken aback that I was at a loss for words. Mother-in-law then added, Our family is growing again. Ethan, you should come back too. Life is better when it's just family. Emily quickly replied, Mom, that's terrible. But you, Ethan, and I can say anything because we're family. But Emma is an outsider. It's rude to say such things. To which mother-in-law also said, You're right. It's rude to an outsider. Sorry. I was so frustrated I had to fight back tears. Just then, my husband calmly put down his chopsticks and muttered, This family is messed up. He stood up, ignored mother-in-law and Emily who tried to follow us, left his parents' home, and put me in the car. Inside the car, my husband said, I'm really sorry. As long as you understand, that's all that matters, I replied. I couldn't meet his gaze, and tears followed. Several nights later, mother-in-law and Emily showed up at our doorstep unannounced. I'm so sorry. I know it's irrational, but I felt like you stole my son. And that just got under my skin. Please forgive me. I'm sorry, too. I have a soft spot for my younger brother, and I took it out on you, they both said, bowing deeply in apology at our front door. Confused by the sudden turn of events, I looked over at my husband, who seemed just as bewildered as I was. I couldn't shake the feeling that they had some ulterior motive, so I wasn't ready to forgive and forget so quickly. If something like this happens again, I don't think I'll be able to forgive you, I warned them. We get it, we really do, they both echoed, bowing their heads once more. Even after mother-in-law and Emily left, I felt uneasy, but my husband looked relieved. Looks like they finally get it. If only that were true. Maybe Emily's upcoming wedding changed her. Perhaps, once she's a daughter-in-law too, she'll get where I'm coming from and make an effort to get along. Trying to convince myself, I pushed down my lingering doubts. Turns out, all my concerns were unwarranted. Mother-in-law and Emily became noticeably nicer to me. When Emily introduced her fiancé, the dinner went off without a hitch. No passive-aggressive comments or anything. Her fiancé seemed as genuine as Emily claimed, a really good guy. Thinking her change of heart might be his influence, I genuinely celebrated her upcoming wedding. Then, mother-in-law asked for my help preparing meals for my father-in-law's memorial service, where many relatives would gather. I would have dreaded this before, but I felt differently about my in-laws now and agreed to stay overnight for cleanup. The morning of the event, I felt a slight headache and some chills. I had no fever, but I didn't want to risk spreading a cold, so I consulted with mother-in-law. She urged me to come, promising she'd also take precautions, so I headed over. When I got there, nearly 20 relatives had gathered. After the memorial service, my husband got called back to work due to some emergency. He left in a hurry, and I stayed at my in-law's home, serving tea and snacks to guests. The post-service dinner was lively. I was bustling around, carrying drinks and food, and doing the dishes. When I glanced around the living room, I noticed my mother-in-law deep in conversation with relatives her own age. Emily, meanwhile, was busy with her phone and had disappeared into her room. Several female relatives on my father-in-law's side helped out, but neither my mother-in-law nor Emily lifted a finger. By the time it got dark, the party was over and the relatives left, although a few of the men had passed out from too much drinking. I was alone in the quiet living room, cleaning up in the kitchen. I had been too busy to think about it earlier, but my headache and chill from the morning had come back. I started to feel dizzy and thought about calling it a night and going home. Just then, my mother-in-law and Emily came into the living room. The moment our eyes met, my mother-in-law said, Oh, you're still here? You're not very efficient, are you? She continued, Well, why don't you just go home? You've been itching to leave, haven't you? The rest is family time. Ethan will be back soon, and we don't need outsiders like you around. What do you mean? As I asked, Emily started laughing. 
You still don't get it, do you? You're just a maid here. How funny. Ethan is part of my and my mom's family, not yours. But hey, you've been entertaining. We'll call you again to be our maid. <laughs> Confused by Emily's contradictions, I asked, If I'm an outsider, then what does that make your fiancé? Emily retorted, What? He's family because I chose him. Just because you're not wanted here doesn't mean he's an outsider. Seriously? You're so clueless. Rolling her eyes, my mother-in-law chimed in. We've told you you can go. Why don't you take those drunk guys with you on your way out? She gestured with her hand as if shooing me away. This is the third time this has happened. I was livid, both at myself for being deceived twice, and at the two of them. The urge to throw whatever was close to me overwhelmed me. Yet, I was so dizzy I couldn't speak, and their mocking faces looked distorted. Feeling my body temperature rise rapidly, I stopped cleaning and stormed out of my in-law's house. Only a few steps out, I started feeling extremely dizzy and my knees gave out. I collapsed right there. That's when Susan, a neighbor I'd seen a few times, rushed over frantically. Hey, are you okay? She cradled me and spoke to me. In my fading consciousness, I muttered, Please, mother-in-law, Emily, let me rest and then blacked out. I thought I heard her scream, but then I lost consciousness and I don't remember what happened next. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. Susan had called an ambulance in a panic and people from the neighborhood had gathered around my in-law's house. Apparently, I had a fever close to 104 degrees Fahrenheit and it was said that it could have been much worse had help arrived any later. Turning to my husband who was crying by my bedside, I asked, who's your family? And then I went back to sleep. After being discharged, my husband and I visited my in-law's house at my request. I had made up my mind during my recovery. Mother-in-law yelled at me, You ruined your father-in-law's memorial service! But I was calm. I told my husband, This is the third time they've harassed me. I can't take it anymore. What do you want to do? If you can't cut ties with your mother and sister, then we should go our separate ways. Who's your family? Without hesitation, he said it was me. Mother-in-law and Emily were momentarily shocked, but Emily... Who's your family? That's laughable. Don't worry, Ethan will come to his senses and come back. Right, Mom? Mother-in-law also laughed, but my husband stood up and declared, That day will never come. He held my hand tightly, and we left my in-law's house behind. I went to Susan's house to thank her for taking care of me on the way home. On my way, everyone I met said, Are you okay? You've been through a lot. For a moment, I was puzzled, but figured the incident must have created quite a stir in the neighborhood. Susan greeted me with a smile and eagerly shared some news. She told me that the moment I was taken away in the ambulance, rumors spread like wildfire about my in-laws being terrible people who were overworking their sick daughter-in-law. Now, nobody even greets my mother-in-law and Emily. And guess what? The story that I saved your life has also spread. Isn't that something? She said, laughing. From her tone and lively expression, I was certain she was the one who'd spread the rumors. She's probably recounting it like some kind of heroic tale. Actually, in that moment when I was losing consciousness, I felt like it was my only chance to expose mother-in-law and Emily. So I made my stand. The truth is, I simply left because they told me to. But since I was really sick, karma hit them in the most unexpected way. But in reality, they must have been really shocked when they saw me collapse in front of them, still wearing my apron. I felt immensely grateful towards Susan. Oddly enough, despite being ignored by the neighbors, mother-in-law and Emily seemed to act as if nothing had changed. I found it puzzling, but decided it didn't matter since I didn't need to understand them anymore. I thanked Susan and headed home. By the time I was feeling better, my husband suggested we move since we might continue to be harassed if we stayed close. I immediately agreed, happy with his decision. Just when I thought it was all over, something more surprising happened. As we were preparing for the move, the doorbell rang. Standing there was Emily's fiancé, bowing his head through the monitor. We invited him in. After taking a deep breath, he said that the engagement was off. Then he slowly began to explain why. Apparently, a few weeks after the memorial service, Emily visited his house in tears, claiming she was being misunderstood by the neighbors due to false accusations from her sister-in-law. 
and then she and her mother moved into his place. Emily couldn't handle any household chores, leaving it all to her mother. But that wasn't the worst of it. My mother-in-law followed them around everywhere, constantly offering unsolicited advice while never contributing financially. She even planned to tag along on their honeymoon. It didn't stop there. Whenever Emily stepped away, her mother-in-law would make cutesy voices at her fiancé and cozy up to him. Fed up with their behavior, the fiancé called off the engagement. Initially, Emily and her mother-in-law threatened legal action. That's when the former fiancé of Emily's, David, stepped in. My parents did some digging, and it seems you've both been lying to me. If you're planning to sue, we will expose all your past behaviors in the appropriate setting. We will also talk to my brother and his wife, he said. Faced with this, Emily and her mother-in-law were at a loss for words. Hearing this story, I finally understood why they were so brazen that day. They probably thought getting married would absolve them of any of the local gossip. Emily had already quit her job, dreaming of a blissful married life. With the engagement off, she tried to get her job back. The company can't run without me, she often boasted, expecting a warm welcome. However, her return was flatly denied. This is what I heard from her co-workers, David continued. I had thought Emily was a high-achieving professional woman, but she was anything but. She made frequent mistakes and had no self-awareness, often blaming her colleagues. Pretending to be carefree, Emily often made insensitive remarks and was cruel to younger female staff behind their backs. When Emily showed up and asked for her job back, the victims spoke out one after another. A small Me Too movement erupted at the office, leading to Emily leaving the company in a fit of rage. After listening to the whole story, my husband said, If your mother and sister are asking for compensation in the divorce case, I'll be happy to assist. But David immediately shook his head. No, no, I just came to say hello. I've heard you've been through a lot too. Glad you're doing better. We both deeply bowed our heads to David. Word around town is that mother-in-law and Emily are still living together in the same house. But apparently, they're not getting along anymore. Kicked out of the company and you're still useless. Trying to seduce my boyfriend, you old hag! They're constantly yelling at each other, I hear. We'd finished our move and even changed our phone numbers. So we were relaxed. Perhaps too much so. Suddenly, we heard that Emily showed up at my husband's office. It was during lunch break, so he took her to a nearby diner. Right as she sat down, she started complaining. Moving without telling us? That's so unfair! And then began to badmouth me, mother-in-law, and her ex-fiancé. She even said, I'm sick of that home. Let me move in with you. Of course, he immediately refused. Emily persisted. Emma just doesn't get it. I'm pretty easygoing. We'll understand each other eventually. To which my husband responded, my family consists of Emma. You're an outsider. As Emily began to retort, looking frustrated, my husband interrupted, if you show up again, I'll call the police. Tell your mother as well. And quickly left to go back to work. I was so relieved that my husband stood firm against Emily that I hugged him from behind without thinking. It seems mother-in-law and Emily will continue to yell at each other while remaining inseparable bad buddies. And I quietly swore to myself to protect my own family. Oh, I've had enough. I was at my wit's end, standing in front of my husband and in-laws. It was a day we were supposed to go on a trip to Hawaii. And my mother-in-law had just told me, I don't remember inviting you. Carter, my husband, just gave me a look that said he wanted to get through this awkward moment as quickly as possible, offering no help. I was done with these people. My name is Rita Rollins. I'm 28 years old. Before getting married, I worked as a bartender. I've always loved drinks, and right after graduating from college, I got a job at a privately owned bar. That's where I met Carter, who had been a regular there even before I started working. I heard from the owner that he was a quiet guy, but he started talking to me more after my second shift. We were the same age, hit it off, and eventually our relationship turned romantic. We got married six months ago. Until I married Carter, I had never moved out of my parents' home. 
there were two reasons for that. First, my workplace was very close to my home. Second, my dad was extremely protective of me. I lost my mom to illness, and being an only child, I was always the apple of my dad's eye. But he didn't just spoil me. He knew when to be strict. My dad is a wealthy businessman, so I've never had to worry about money. I was able to go to college thanks to his financial support. I don't know all the details, but he seems to be involved in managing several companies. He cried so much at my wedding that the staff had to caution him. But he trusted Carter and sent me off as a bride. So I finally moved out and started my life with Carter. But reality was different from what I had dreamed. It all started when my mother-in-law began visiting our home. After marrying Carter, I quit my job and became a homemaker. Carter works as a driver for a small transportation company. He leaves early in the morning and comes home late at night, so I had a lot of free time. That's when my mother-in-law started to meddle in my life. One day, after seeing Carter off and doing some laundry, the doorbell rang. I checked the monitor and saw it was her. Hello? Oh, has Carter gone to work? Yes, he just left. I brought these cupcakes that Carter loves. Could you give them to him? Thanks for your kindness. We'll enjoy them later. I thought my response was perfectly polite, but she suddenly frowned and said, What are you talking about? There's none for you. I made these for Carter. Her words were so cold and pointed that they hurt me a bit. Seeing me look down, she said, Don't be so sensitive. Just let me in already. And pushed past me into the house. Leaving me stunned, she headed straight for the living room. I hurriedly followed her. By the way, there's something I want to talk to you about. As soon as she sat on the sofa, she said it. I had no idea what she was talking about, so I just waited for her to continue. When am I going to see my first grandchild? What? We don't have plans for that anytime soon. What do you mean, no plans? You're worthless as a wife, then. My mother-in-law's unexpected visit was filled with nothing but derogatory comments towards me. Carter and I had decided to wait until we were 30 to have kids. We're not financially stable yet, and we don't want to bring a child into a world where they'd struggle. But my mother-in-law dismissed our plans, saying I had no value. Isn't that our choice to make? She didn't expect me to talk back. She furrowed her brows and yelled, How dare you defy me, a wife who can't even give me grandchildren! I never said I can't have children. I said the timing isn't right. A woman who can't give birth, when I want her to, is as worthless as one who can't give birth at all. I felt irritated by her words and fired back, but she didn't stop. Enough! This is pointless! With that, she left. That night, Carter looked at me apologetically and said, Hey, Rita. We should have a kid. Did your mom say something to you? I immediately suspected that the events of the day had something to do with this impressed Carter. But he remained silent, looking down. Tell me the truth. Your mom said something, didn't she? Well, it's both. Dad yelled at me to get you pregnant already. Probably mom's idea. Dad has always been under Mom's thumb. I felt my spirits sink. Carter is kind to me, but he lacks assertiveness. I knew he wasn't confrontational, but he never complains even when things are against him. Now I was sure. It's not that he won't say anything. He can't. I'm going to your parents' house tomorrow. Our home and my in-laws are just a 20-minute drive apart. I could go there any time. 
but what if we just have a kid like they want? Wouldn't that calm them down? I was infuriated by Carter's weak response. Do you really want to have a child now? Have you forgotten that we agreed to wait until we save some money? Well, can't we just ask your dad for money? He's really wealthy, right? <sighs> I sighed deeply and stopped preparing dinner. Then I looked at Carter and said, don't you find that embarrassing? If we have a child, we're the parents. How do you plan to raise a child when we can't even manage our own finances? When I said this assertively, Carter deflated and mumbled, Sorry, ending the conversation. I've always been strong-willed, even handling customer complaints when I was a bartender. Carter, despite being an athlete, is weak-willed. He may look muscular and strong, but he has a fragile heart, a disappointing balance. The next day, as promised, I visited my in-laws. The person who opened the door was my mother-in-law. Oh, what brings you here all of a sudden? It's rare for you to visit. Come in. She treated me with unexpected courtesy. Walking into the living room, I saw my father-in-law scrutinizing a pile of brochures on the table. Mother-in-law, about yesterday. It's about having kids. I'd like to get straight to the point, so I tried to steer the conversation that way. But father-in-law interrupted me. Rita, if we go on vacation for Christmas, would you prefer Hawaii or Florida? I was speechless, not understanding the sudden change in topic. Father-in-law's tone hardened. Can't you even answer a simple question? My dear, it's okay. Rita is a worthless person after all. Father-in-law yelled, and mother-in-law made a condescending comment. I felt my anger rising. But I decided to hold back, not wanting to stoop to their level. I'd choose Hawaii. Crossing the ocean makes it feel more like a vacation. All right, let's go with Hawaii then. By the way, why Hawaii? We got a bonus, and we want to go to a seaside destination with Carter. I couldn't reconcile this with father-in-law, with the man who had been pressuring me to have children through Carter. I had assumed it would be a trip for just mother-in-law and father-in-law, but apparently I was wrong. But I would realize my mistake much later. Father-in-law seemed in high spirits now that the vacation spot was decided. I lost the urge to bring up yesterday's issues and ruin his mood, so I decided to leave quietly. But mother-in-law stopped me. What is it? I thought you should have this. She handed me a folded letter-sized paper. When I opened it, it was filled with names. Frederick, Dylan, Jerry, Oliver, what is this? It's a list of names for our grandchild. Pick one when the baby is born. What? I couldn't help but shout. Yesterday, she was berating me for not having kids. And today she's handing me a list of names for a child we haven't even planned yet? And upon closer inspection, there were no names that seemed suitable for a girl. Um, do you plan to give me a list for girls, too? Mother-in-law looked at me as if I was absurd. What are you talking about? We only want a boy. We can't let the Rollins lineage die out. That list is based on the assumption you'll have a boy. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. What could I possibly say to that? Her way of thinking was so outlandish that I started to question my own sanity. For the first time in my life, I had met someone with such a different sense of common decency. Look, I have many questions, but let's stick to one due to time constraints. What if a girl is born? My voice trembled slightly with suppressed anger. I felt like lunging at mother-in-law right then and there. That's simple. 
We just won't acknowledge her as our grandchild. If a girl is born, still name her from this list. If you don't like that, then do your best to have a boy. Mother-in-law said this with a mocking smile. Meanwhile, father-in-law was engrossed in online shopping, probably looking for things to take to Hawaii. I caught a glimpse of swimsuit images on his screen. Suddenly, I felt a headache coming on and left my in-law's house. When I got home, I told Carter about today's events. He just hummed. Hmm. Not offering much in response. Shouldn't we focus on preparing for Hawaii first? When did they say we were going? You know, I started to speak but stopped myself. Arguing now wouldn't solve anything with Carter. It made more sense to prepare for the upcoming trip. We were leaving this weekend. During the Christmas break, and Carter also had time off from work. We don't have time to buy new stuff, come to think of it. We don't even have a suitcase. My dad has some. I'll borrow them tomorrow. My dad loves to travel and has several suitcases. Borrowing a couple wouldn't be a big deal. I contacted him on my phone and arranged to pick them up the next day. On the day of the trip, having successfully borrowed the suitcases, Carter and I headed to the meeting point mentioned in a message from mother-in-law to Carter. When we arrived, my in-laws were already there. Sorry to keep you waiting. I apologized as soon as we got there. But my in-laws looked at me strangely. Honey, did you invite Rita? No. What's going on with the both of you? Like Carter, I was clueless about what was happening. Then mother-in-law said with a feigned, innocent expression, We don't remember inviting Rita. Time seemed to freeze for Carter and me. What do you mean? You said with Carter, didn't you? <laughs> mother-in-law laughed loudly. That meant with our parents, too. This isn't the only meeting point. You can't be serious. Of course, we wouldn't invite a useless daughter-in-law. Carter, here's your ticket. Mother-in-law handed the plane ticket to Carter right in front of me. I felt a chilling humiliation, as if I'd been deliberately excluded. It was a huge insult. They must have intentionally misled me as evidence by their creepy smiles. When I glanced at Carter, he just looked down, avoiding eye contact. So he won't even help me now. At that moment, I lost all interest in dealing with these people, including Carter. Even if I had gone on the trip, it would never have been a meaningful experience. Fine, whatever. I said, dragging my suitcase filled with pointless hopes and excitement away from the scene. I returned home, unpacked the suitcases, and headed straight to my parents' house. I thought I'd tell them what happened today while returning the unused suitcases. When I arrived, my overprotective dad greeted me with a hug. I found his boyfriend-like hugs a bit annoying, but I was also grateful for his affection. Did you enjoy your trip to Hawaii? He asked with sparkling eyes. He probably wished he could have gone with me, but I shattered that expectation. I didn't go because I'm the daughter-in-law. Confused, my dad asked, What do you mean? As to answer his question, I recounted everything that had happened up to today. That's terrible, especially on Carter's part. A husband's job is to protect his wife, even if the opponents are his own parents. I had to stand up to my in-laws, who opposed our marriage, and that's how I got to marry your mom. My dad said, He's a cheerful guy, who mixes humor into his conversations, making them enjoyable. But his eyes weren't laughing this time. 
Is Carter's dad's name Fred Rollins? And he works at New Wave Corporation, right? I didn't know why he was asking, but I nodded because he was correct. Just leave the rest to Daddy, he said with a smile, ending the conversation. The day Carter and his parents were supposed to return from Hawaii arrived. I was summoned by my dad, and we headed to the airport together. We waited in the arrival lobby for Carter and his parents. Thirty minutes later, they emerged, talking and laughing. My dad immediately approached the trio. I hurriedly followed. Carter was the first to notice my dad. He stopped dead in his tracks, looking as if he'd seen a ghost. His parents noticed his reaction. Just as mother-in-law asked Carter, What's wrong? My dad spoke up. Hello, I'm Rita's father. The three reacted nervously to his words. Uh, hello. Father-in-law responded with his tone much weaker than when he had spoken to me. Do you know why I'm here? The aura my dad emitted was intense. He's built a massive fortune over the years and knows how to control the conversation. The three seemed to know what this was about. They looked down, trying to avoid the issue. My dad took a step closer and said, I heard my daughter was excluded from the Hawaii trip. Is that correct? Um, well... Carter, didn't I tell you to take good care of my daughter when you asked for her hand in marriage? You've betrayed that trust, haven't you? Carter glanced at my dad's face for a moment, then quickly looked away, mumbling, I'm sorry. But my dad didn't let that go. Apologizing means you've done something wrong, doesn't it, Mr. Rollins? Uh... Both Carter and mother-in-law were at a loss for words. Though the airport was bustling, our corner felt like a different world. Thanks to my dad steering us to a less crowded area, no one was paying us much attention. Mr. Rollins, let me make one thing clear. If you don't honestly tell me what happened, I won't forgive you. On the defensive, Carter and his parents finally had father-in-law speak up, perhaps to save face. What do you mean, won't forgive? What are you planning to do? I'll shut down your workplace. Ha ha, what a joke! <laughs> father-in-law started laughing but trailed off as he met my dad's serious gaze. You work at New Wave Corporation, right? The bank recently approached me about providing funding and management reforms for New Wave. If I decide it's not worth saving, the bank wants to pull its funding before the debt grows any further. I was considering helping out, given that it's the company where my daughter's father-in-law works, but it seems like it's not worth it after all. For the first time, father-in-law's eyes, which had been locked down on me, began to twitch. You can't mix personal matters with business. You'll leave not just me, but the other employees out on the street. Father-in-law's face turned pale. But my dad was relentless. I don't mind. It's a company that is bound to fail sooner or later. Besides, my daughter is more important than employees losing their jobs. I really wanted Carter to take on this role. But it seems I misjudged him. Sorry, Rita. My intuition failed me this time. Carter looked miserable, unable to argue against the accusations. From my perspective, I felt more secure with someone like my dad who truly cared about me. Come on, both of you. Stand up for yourselves. Say something, darlings. You too, Carter. Mother-in-law was panicking, but my dad didn't let her off the hook either. Mrs. Rollins, you're also part of the problem, aren't you? Why are you trying to force Rita to have a child against her will? Let's hear your excuse. My dad glared at mother-in-law with a low, stern voice. Mother-in-law flinched, unable to respond. Have a boy? Choose a name from this list? She's worthless? Who do you think you are? Um, well... Mother-in-law was increasingly cornered by my dad. Sweat forming on her forehead. But my dad didn't stop. If you're going to make arbitrary decisions, then so will we. 
First, we'll have Rita separate from Carter. What? Carter looked up shocked. The discussion with my daughter is already done. The divorce papers are filled out. Without Rita, you won't even have the chance for grandchildren. We were looking forward to seeing our grandchildren. I don't care. I won't sacrifice my daughter for your selfish desires. Even I, as her father, don't interfere in her life. You have no right to. The three of them were flustered, and no one spoke. You'll pay the price for trying to control Rita's life. Please, I love Rita. Forgive us. At the very end, Carter pleaded with my dad. But my dad merely glanced at him. That's not for me to decide. When my dad's gaze turned to me, I clearly said, Please don't include me in your lives anymore. Goodbye. Rejecting Carter's plea. Carter groaned. Oh! And mother-in-law started to cry, possibly out of shock. Father-in-law just stood there stunned. A week later, the divorce was finalized through a lawyer. My dad knows a lot of people, many of whom are lawyers or accountants, people who know the law. Thanks to one of my dad's contacts handling the divorce, I was able to receive compensation for the harassment I endured from my in-laws. My dad then told the bank that father-in-law's company wasn't worth saving. Heeding my dad's advice, the bank abandoned New Wave Corporation, which went bankrupt a month later. My dad also took action against Carter. He asked a police officer he knew to investigate my husband's company on some pretext. Turns out, small companies often engage in illegal activities, and the CEO was caught evading taxes. That company also went bankrupt due to the CEO's arrest. Mother-in-law was a homemaker, so my dad didn't do anything to her, but she's probably panicking since her husband and son both lost their jobs. I can picture her frantic state. When I happened to see mother-in-law in town, she looked frail and on the verge of collapsing. This whole experience made me realize the huge gap between the ideal and reality in married life. I was harassed by my in-laws and got no help from the husband, who should have been my main support. Yet the reason I'd consider marrying again is to give back to my loving father by letting him see his grandchildren. For now, I'm on my own. But someday, I hope to meet someone truly wonderful. Oof. You all need to shut up. Always nagging at me? Yeah, yeah, I get it. I'm the bad guy here. Happy now? <laughs> Laughing flippantly, the person speaking to me was embarrassingly my husband. If I had known he was such a lowlife from the beginning, I never would have married him. But now, it's too late. As I was thinking this, an unexpected voice yelled at my stupid husband. What? My name is Emily, a 28-year-old office worker. I live with my husband Liam and we don't have any children yet. I also have my precious little chihuahua, Lulu, who I have had since I was single. She's a clever little troublemaker always scratching at drawers to drag things out. Oh, uh, by the way... I'm having dinner with Ethan next Saturday night. My husband mentioned this over dinner. With your brother. You two are really close, aren't you? Ethan is my brother. My husband and brother have been friends since elementary school and quickly became close because of their shared interests like soccer. Sometimes I even get jealous of how close they are. Ethan told me the other day, has Emily's cooking ever made you sick? <laughs> Ugh, my brother is still as rude as ever. I was a bit annoyed by that comment. If you have an older sibling, you may relate, but I think there are two types. One is the type that dotes on the younger sibling. One of my friends has a younger sister and loves her even more than her parents do, she claims. The other type is a bully, always demanding what's yours. My brother falls into this category. Huh, not eating the strawberry? Well, I'll take it then. The person who would casually swipe the strawberry off my cake that I was saving for last was my brother. Even now, it makes me mad. My brother and I have never really gotten along. 
but I do owe him one big thank you. One of my friends wants your number. Some people have weird tastes, huh? He said this with a sigh, handing over the contact info. That friend turned out to be Liam, my now husband. So my brother was like a cupid for our love. When we decided to get married, my drunken brother said to Liam, You sure about this? You can still back out. She's like a gorilla at home, you know? <laughs> to which my husband replied, You're the only one who thinks that. I've been interested in Emily for a long time. That's what my husband told me. His words were met with a gross, oh, <laughs> from my brother. What an awful brother. My husband Liam was a star of the soccer team and was quite popular in our generation. Thinking back, my brother was just as popular, but I never understood why. At home, he was arrogant, selfish, and gorilla-like. Wait, am I saying the same thing as my brother? <laughs> Even after marriage, Liam was as kind as ever, and I was very happy. I didn't realize that this happiness was slowly, slowly beginning to crumble. One day, my husband came home visibly frustrated. Oh, today was the worst. Welcome back. Oh, uh, what happened? It was rare for Liam to get this angry. Apparently, as he was about to get in the car to come home, he noticed a scratch on it. He said it wasn't there this morning, but he honestly wasn't sure when it happened. I should have installed a dash cam. My husband's car didn't have a dash cam. I had one in my car, but my husband has been driving his current car for nearly 10 years because he likes it. I had suggested getting a dash cam, but he said, I have never been in an accident or anything, so I think I'm good for now. He kept putting it off saying things like that, but this time he seemed quite upset. Emily, I'm sorry, but can you go to the car shop tomorrow and get a dash cam installed? I don't really understand machines. Since I had the next day off from work and had no particular plans, I gladly agreed. The next day, my husband went to work in my car. I had driven my husband's car a few times, but as someone who usually drives a compact car, his larger car felt a little scary to me. That night, when I told my husband that the installation was successfully completed, he was in high spirits saying, now I can feel safe no matter what happens. Seeing his response, I thought to myself, that's right, I can feel safe no matter what happens too, and smiled a little. Soon after, my husband would fall into hell. Around this time, I noticed that my brother had been contacting me more often. It wasn't anything serious, just casual conversations like, how have you been? Or are you getting along with Liam? Mostly, we share trivial updates about our lives. I found my brother's behavior a little strange, but I thought, maybe he's finally starting to find his little sister cute? Bro, it's great that you're friends with Liam, but you're going out drinking too much lately. When I said that, my brother went silent for a moment, then said, Oh, uh, sorry, sorry. Naomi and I have been fighting a lot, and I have things I want to talk about. He laughed over the phone. Naomi is my brother's wife and my sister-in-law. My brother and Naomi were high school classmates and have been dating since then. I don't think of my brother this way, but he and the beautiful Naomi were known as the most attractive couple in school. I was also close to Naomi, as she was my senior in the same club, and we had been friends since our student days. Then, one day, something happened. I still remember vividly. It was a day of heavy rain from the morning and my husband was in a bad mood as he watched the weather forecast. Oh, rain all day. I hate going to the company for negotiations today. The road is narrow. His company doesn't have company cars. They reimburse for gas. But employees must use their personal cars for outside work. Recently, the company's performance has been improving and the president has finally started considering buying a few company cars next year. He happily told me the other day, so I said to him, Why don't you use my car today? I realized after I said it that my car is pink and maybe it's too cute for my husband to drive. He seemed to think the same thing, hesitated for a moment, but then said, Is that okay? Last time I drove Emily's car. It handled well. I'll uh, take you up on that. And he went to work as usual. Well, time for me to go to work too. With that thought, I left the house as usual. The rain was getting stronger, almost like a typhoon. My usual commute route looked like a different road in the heavy rain, even with the wipers on full blast, and today, I was commuting in my husband's unfamiliar car. I shouldn't have switched cars. I thought, that's when it happened. Ah! Oh. 
With a loud thud, the car I was driving crashed into a utility pole. At first, I didn't understand what had happened, but when I slowly opened my eyes, I saw a passenger car right next to mine. That's right, that car suddenly jumped out from the side, and I swerved to avoid it and hit the pole. Then I lost consciousness. I thought I heard the sounds of police and ambulance sirens in the distance. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. Hey, e Ethan, Emily's awake! A familiar voice, it was my sister-in-law Naomi. Uh huh, Naomi, why are you here? Where am I? Ouch! I felt a little pain, perhaps from hitting my head. My hands and feet moved properly. If I hadn't turned the steering wheel at the last moment during the accident, I might not be alive now. The thought sent chills down my spine. Hey, Emily, stay still. Lie down quickly. I I'm here with you. My brother, with tears in his eyes for some reason, was sitting next to Naomi. Seeing my brother like that, Naomi chuckled. Ethan, you're overreacting. Calm down. Looking at the two of them, I asked, uh, More importantly, why are you two here? Where is Liam? At my question, the smiles on their faces vanished instantly. The hospital tried to contact Liam first from your address book, but he didn't answer because he was at work, so they called me next. My brother explained, I had written emergency contacts in my address book. First was, of course, my husband Liam. Second, after considering my parents, I chose my brother who lives nearby. Third were my parents. It seemed the hospital had contacted them from my belongings after I was rushed in. Then, the two of them looked at each other with awkward faces. It's okay, big brother. I have a pretty good idea of what's going on, I told them. The day I drove my husband's car to get the dashcam installed, I felt something off the moment I got in. A strong perfume scent, familiar and unpleasant. That's right, our dog Lulu barked more than usual at my husband the other day and I smelt the scent then. My woman's intuition kicked in and I opened the dashboard. Recent movie ticket stubs and a single earring I didn't recognize fallen under the passenger seat. It seemed my bad feeling had come true. At my words, the two looked surprised but said, Calm down, okay? My brother showed me something. I knew it. Afterwards, the doctor came into the room and examined me. There were no abnormalities in my brain or body. The pain in my head was from a scratch on my forehead, which would heal naturally in a few days without leaving a scar. I was relieved as I didn't want a scar. It's near a miracle that you came out of that accident with only this. You're really lucky, the doctor said. My brother and his wife were relieved at the test results, telling me to call them if I needed anything. After saying that, he and his wife went home. A while later, my husband Liam rushed into the hospital room, looking frantic. E Emily, you had an accident? Oh, are you okay? I explained to my husband what had happened and that I needed to stay in the hospital for a few days. Then my husband said, Oh, uh, it's not a big deal then. I had so many missed calls from the hospital, I thought uh, I didn't need to rush here. He sighed and said that to me. I stared at my husband with cold eyes and told him that I was thinking of going back to my parents' house to rest for a while after being discharged from the hospital. The moment I mentioned it, my husband's voice noticeably perked up. Oh, well, that's great. You don't have to worry about me. Take it easy at your parents' place. I'll even come to pick you up. No problem. His face was clearly delighted. Looking at him, I thought from the bottom of my heart that he was an idiot, as if I would worry about you. I had suspected it, but my husband was indeed having an affair. The fact that he could be so callous to his wife who might have lost her life showed that he was quite infatuated with his lover. His insistence on picking me up from my parents' house was a clear sign that he didn't want me to come home unexpectedly. Enjoy it while you can, you better be prepared. A few days later, my husband came to pick me up when I was discharged. We stopped by our house to pack and then headed straight to my parents' home. Usually, I would sit in the front passenger seat when going out with my husband, but this time I deliberately sat in the back. M make sure you call me when you want me to pick you up. Uh, absolutely. I almost laughed at my all-too-obvious husband but managed to hold it in. Yeah, I, I understand. Sorry that you'll have to use my car for a while. I didn't feel bad at all, but I spoke apologetically. My husband replied, uh, No problem at all. I, I like this car. <laughs>
He cheerfully said he would take good care of my car and went home in a good mood. I like that car, but I will never drive it again. About a week after returning to my parents' house, I went back to our home. I'm home! I shouted loud enough to be heard in any room. Sure enough, I heard a commotion from the back room. A few minutes later, my husband came rushing out. Hey, hey, I told you to call, didn't I? Why did you come back all of a sudden? He seemed quite flustered, almost angry. Oh, I forgot. Maybe it's because I hit my head in the accident. Sorry, sorry. Uh, but more importantly, I have something to talk to the person hiding in the back room. Can you bring her out? And hey, your clothes are inside out. I said with a bright smile. My husband's face turned pale in an instant. And then he finally realized that behind me were my parents, my brother and his wife, and even his own parents who had come all the way. What? Wha why? His father, a strict man, yelled, bring her out now. A few minutes later, after letting everyone into the living room, my husband and his lover awkwardly entered from the back room. No wonder they were uncomfortable. It was two against seven. My husband was overwhelmingly at a disadvantage. <laughs> the two of them looked down and didn't say a word. Everyone, including me, was irritated. It's been a while, hasn't it? Maria, right? At my words, the two of them flinched. I knew this woman. She was a year younger than me in high school and was a soccer team's manager. My brother and I were a year apart and my husband and Maria only overlapped for one year. She used to pick fights with me while waiting for Liam, my husband after practice, even after he graduated and went to college. Emily, you're so tall and stylish. I'm really jealous. I'm so small, but Liam said he likes small girls, so it's surprising. She was the type to pick up fight with a smile on her face. That continued even after Liam graduated and went to college. When I contacted Liam the other day, he replied right away and I was so happy. Please thank him for me, Emily, or... You know, they say that relationships between college students and high school students don't last long. Aren't you worried? Were some of the things she said. Back then, I had an inexplicable confidence that my husband was head over heels in love with me, so I didn't pay any attention to her. That must have been frustrating for Maria. I was worried about work, and suddenly Maria started sobbing. Her silly way of speaking hadn't changed at all, and it irritated me greatly. I almost launched at her, but a glance at my sister-in-law Naomi, who was sitting next to me, told me she felt the same way. She was forcefully holding down her right hand with her left. <laughs> the two of them explained that Maria worked at the reception desk of one of my husband's company's clients. They had reconnected over old stories and started meeting alone after work. But they insisted that there was nothing suspicious about their relationship. It was just advice, nothing more. My husband kept repeating this like a mantra. Is he crazy? Has he been cursed? Hmm. Oh, Maria, I saw the tag on your skirt when you came into the room earlier. Isn't it inside out? Immediately, both of them checked her skirt, but of course, I was lying. They made a face as if they had been caught, but it was too late. However, my husband's shirt really was inside out. What kind of advice requires you to take off your skirt in someone else's bedroom? Are you stupid? I said that to the two fools. Whether they didn't like my attitude or were too flustered to understand my husband snapped. Where's the evidence? It's unfair to accuse us without any evidence. He actually had the nerve to get angry? My parents, in-laws and I were so angry that our faces turned bright red. It was clear that everyone was furious. Hey, you have been noisy since earlier, my brother said and then he played a video on the TV. It was a footage from the dashcam on the day of the accident. The loud thud made it clear that the impact was quite strong. The other driver, perhaps in shock, initially refused to admit fault. At the hospital, I apparently raged that I wasn't at fault. The police showed the footage to my brother who was nearby and it clearly showed the other car speeding into me and running a red light just before the collision. This evidence led to the conclusion that it was almost entirely the other driver's fault. However, the footage before the accident clearly showed my husband and Maria happily driving together. I don't want to go home yet. Maria said, you're really cute. My husband replied, stroking Maria's head at a red light. Then he said, you're so helpless and drove into a hotel parking lot. On another day, Maria said, work ended early. I wanted to see you. Is your wife okay with this? My husband replied, 
I told her I'm going out with Ethan, so it's totally fine. And kiss Maria. Ugh. My mother-in-law started crying. Even though I had seen it once before, I felt nauseous. I didn't know the inside of the car was being recorded. That's cheating. My brother looked at my husband with cold eyes and said, You know, Naomi has always been telling me that Liam is definitely cheating, but I always believed there was no way. With a cold look, my brother stared at my husband. Naomi seemed to have stumbled upon an account on social media that looked like Maria's. There were no faces shown, but there were plenty of suggestive photos like a profile of my husband, the watch he wore, and the interior of his car. I immediately consulted my brother, but at first, he didn't believe it. I heard that this caused a lot of fights between my brother and his wife. Still, it seemed he had some doubts, and he told me that he had been contacting me regularly. The decisive factor was the dashcam footage from the day of the accident. You know how I felt when I saw that footage? My brother asked. My husband, after a brief silence, snapped back. Ugh, ugh. All of you are so annoying, always nagging. Okay, okay, I was wrong. <laughs> Happy now? Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, why didn't I notice what kind of a person he was? I wish I could go back to my youth. As I was lost in thought, an unexpected person yelled at my husband who was laughing in front of me. It was not my brother, sister-in-law, or in-laws, but my daddy, who had been silently listening to the conversation. Hey, you, who do you think you are? What's with that attitude? What are you doing to my daughter? My brother and I unconsciously trembled at the sight of daddy like this. My parents are gentle people, especially daddy who once said, Look, Emily, this flower is trying hard to live too. When I was young, I stepped on a flower and he said this so quietly and kindly. He was kind, even to plants. There was only one time when daddy, who was like a Buddha, lost his temper with my brother and me. I think it was when my brother and I didn't listen to mom at all. And then a door in the corner of my memory seemed to open. My brother and I, who usually don't get along, vowed deeply at that moment never to make daddy angry again. Ah. <sighs> My husband, who had been so bold until now, now completely subdued by the sight of daddy, who was completely different than usual. Standing like a guardian deity, daddy was next to my mother, who was looking at my husband as if he were filled. <laughs> Afterwards, my in-laws bowed deeply to our family and took my foolish husband home. By the way, Maria, the other woman, was sent home on foot. As they were leaving, my brother told my husband, I will never forgive you for hurting my precious sister. He said it quietly. By the way, my husband used my brother as an excuse for his secret meetings with his lover, thinking that my brother and I were on bad terms and wouldn't pry too much. I want to slap you with this right hand right now, but it would hurt my hand. You're not even worth that pain, said my sister-in-law Naomi. Naomi and I were former volleyball players. Unlike me, who was always a reserve, Naomi was the ace attacker. Just thinking about her slapping someone sends shivers down my spine. My ex-husband should consider himself lucky to have escaped with his life. After some time, our divorce was finalized. Thanks to my in-laws, my ex-husband reluctantly paid the compensation in the divorce settlement, spending all his money. I'll buy a new car with the insurance money from the accident. My ex-husband was all excited about this, but the insurance money for his old car wasn't enough to buy a new one. After paying me the compensation, he was left with just enough to buy a used compact car. Oh man, driving a compact car is shameful. My ex-husband, who had this prejudice, was happily driving my car even though his own car was totaled in the accident. The reason? Maria, his mistress, had said, This car is so cute, and his happy face was clearly captured on my dashcam. Speaking of Maria... She seems to have borrowed money from her parents to pay me the compensation in the divorce settlement. Now, under her strict parents' watch, she's working non-stop to pay out the debt. Her relationship with my ex-husband continued for a while, but he became neurotic due to Maria's emotional ups and downs, quit his job suddenly, and now his whereabouts are unknown. Despite this situation, Maria's social media had a single line, Finally, he's mine. I'll chase him forever. Yes, it seems like it was written only one word. It's like something out of a horror story. My ex-husband got involved with a terrible woman, but that's his problem now. It does not matter to me. As for me, I sold my tainted car and used the money as a down payment for a new one.
I rented a place near my office and I'm living happily with my beloved dog Lulu. Come to think of it, Lulu never warmed up to my ex-husband. Maybe it was her animal instinct? I have been visiting my parents more often and recently, we celebrated their wedding anniversary with my brother and his wife. As I was serving a strawberry whole cake, I asked my brother, who was sitting next to me, Brother, do you want a strawberry? He replied, Yes, please. Like a child. I looked at my brother eating the strawberry with a smile. It seems that from now on, my brother and I will get along well.